Well, I don't think anyone can deny that we have a problem here. We're in an ethical mess. I started working in the prisons 35 years ago. There were 229,000 people in prison. Today, there's 2.3 million. The financial crisis has rocked the world and shaken markets worldwide. Lenders were encouraged by the government to lend to less creditworthy buyers. Almost everyone in a position of financial authority embraced it. At the same time, they sold them short and hammered them like mad, raked in money. At every level, they were deceiving the people they were dealing with. Well, Wall Street not only saw no evil, but saw a great deal of virtue, which could be quantified in billions of dollars. That was the virtue of it. Why are we surprised when there's a lack of ethics in the lenders, Wall Street, government? It's an inescapable consequence of neglecting moral training. One of the things we need to do is resensitize ourselves to evil and resensitize ourselves to good. That was a time when I should have stopped and said, wait a minute, Mr. President, think about the consequences of this. But I did not. Self-righteousness is believing you're so good that you couldn't be compromised. And that's the kind of pride that's fatal. Business schools need to start thinking about right and wrong and ethics. But that's a very difficult challenge if the professors don't know how to teach it or think that way. Students simply were not aware of questions of moral philosophy. They say, well, ethics is following your own integrity or following your conscience. But what if you have a poorly formed conscience? What if you're a jerk? The problem is, in a Harvard Business School, there's no fundamental agreement on the way the world works. And so you're reduced to discussing practical behavior. So truth has got to be knowable for there to be ethics. It would be hard to live a life as a consistent moral relativist, not making any kinds of moral claims. If you're a purely accepted moral relativist position, then you have no ground on which to stand to say why another person is wrong. The sure consequence of the attempt to liberate oneself from demanding moral norms and obligations is slavery. It's resulting in more harm to the society in general than anything else in my lifetime. It is unutterably destructive. How's that working for you? Eugenics is very much alive and well. It's back. And we now face the question, are we going to buy it or not buy it? A proper understanding of who the human person is. If we lose that, and we are losing that, it becomes very, very dangerous. Quadriplegics like me have never fared well in societies that view life as dispensable. People are created equal and endowed by their created with certain equal rights. This is the fundamental ethic on which the Western civilization was built. You don't give human rights to people and you can't take them away. Uh, human rights are God-given. Central power, like all power, has to be checked. It has to be limited. Government must be under the moral law. And if the government violates those rights, it should be changed. My uncle did write and did say, if a law is unjust, it is our moral responsibility to resist the unjust law. And that is the basis of the civil rights movement. the case of Tycho and innumerable other recent cases, it all went terribly wrong. Things uh, were pretty badly broken inside the company. When you lose a sense of trust, market economies fail. The dream is, if I can just achieve this much more, I'll fill that emptiness. The thing with money is it doesn't make you happy. Doing the right things, that's what makes you happy. We made a decision that we thought was going to cost us money. I don't think it's cost us a dime by being a good corporate responsible citizen. But the market also both requires and nurtures the virtue of service, hard work, and discipline, and diligence. It's got to begin in homes, and churches, and schools. At every level, we have to be working together to rebuild a consensus around a sound and coherent ethic. The family, religion, you know, culture, this is what has to be transformed. Our recognition of duty to do what's right even in the face of powerful temptations and incentives to do what's wrong. That is the great goal of life. Am I doing what's right for other people who, like me, are made in the image and likeness of God?
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Biola University. This is an important day. This is an important day, and we are so honored that you've taken time out of your Saturdays to be here. I've seen the uh, list of those who are here. This is an impressive group. Uh, we are um, in store for an incredible conversation that is a conversation that needs to be told and retold. And this whole series, Doing the Right Thing, I believe is going to be compelling for the body of Christ in ways that are going to exceed our imagination. I've anticipated this day for a very long time. Uh, last summer, I had a chance to uh, discuss the possibility of something like this with Chuck Colson and Alan Terwilliger and the team in Virginia, and here it is, the manifestation of that. But it's, this is not just a one-day event. This is, I believe, something that is going to uh, have a ripple effect, not only through Southern California, but throughout the world. And we are so honored, Chuck Colson, to be able to collaborate with you, uh, Biola University and the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, on this important conversation. Uh, th this is the first event, by the way, of the series that uh, the Colson Center for Christian Worldview will be doing on doing the right thing, and I believe Biola is doing the right thing by being the first uh, in this series. Uh, tomorrow they'll be in Berkeley, California, and then they're going on from there. And again, we're uh, so honored to have uh, our good brother in Christ, Chuck Colson, here. And I echo your words, Chuck, from a recent article that there has never been a more important time for believers to work together to proclaim the good news and for ministries to collaborate together in ways unlike ever before. That's not only just the, the right thing, that's a biblical thing to do. So this idea of collaboration that we're seeing and you'll hear more about today is so important for us. At Biola University, we believe university not only needs to be committed to the highest standards of scholarship, but it committed to the spiritual life as well. Believing and doing, what we call conviction and courage. The conviction to believe that at the ideological core there is truth. Uh, formed around the understanding of God, and out of that conviction, uh, courageous things happen, and you're gonna hear a lot about courage today. These are the goals of Bible University and such a fitting relationship that we have with Chuck Colson, with the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, what the, was happening at, at Breakpoint, and with other like-minded institutions and ministries that care deeply about these never-changing values. So with a shared commitment to biblical fidelity, thinking Christianly about the major issues of the day, about all dimensions of life, Biola University and the Colson Center are working together to restore the gospel of the kingdom and equip believers with the resources to have and the tools that they need. And you're going to hear more about that today, including this incredible video series, Doing the Right Thing, of which you have just seen a small portion Today's events come out of that collaboration and I'm honored that we have Chuck Colson here at Biola to participate in this significant event. And again, collaboration is so important. The days of going at it alone and competition are over. And the kingdom of God calls us to join together as part of the movement under the sovereign work of God and the impetus of the Holy Spirit. We're excited today that uh, Sean McDowell is here, Biola Talbot graduate, we welcome him. Haven't seen him around campus recently, and it's just great to have Sean here. Also, John Stone Street's here. A pleasure to have you, John, as well from Summit Ministries, also working with Breakpoint as well. Um, Biola's own Scott Ray, who you saw a portion of that video, a professor of the philosophy of religion and ethics, and uh, part of a team here that is leading the largest MA program in philosophy in the world sending students out to some of the finest graduate PhD programs so that they can become those trusted voices rooted and grounded in the hope of Christ and the eternal truths of scripture and some of the major institutions of the day. So it's gonna be an exciting day. We have a lot in store, so I'm gonna step away for a minute, but I, I wanna say again, thank you for coming. We have a capacity crowd here today. It was, uh, nine years ago that Chuck Colson and I were in a car and he was talking about some early stages of thinking about lectures like these and conversations like these and I made the mistake of saying, Chuck, I'm not sure if anybody's gonna come. Uh, first of all, you don't say that to Chuck Colson. 
because um, he's usually right. And um, he looked at me like, why would people not come? Why would people not want to be engaged in this kind of a conversation? The world needs, my friends, these kinds of conversations, and the world is hungry for them. The fact that this place is full today is an indication that we want to talk deeply about these important value-laden uh, conversations that, that, that have an effect in all aspects of our lives. So I'm looking forward to sitting right in the front row today and listening with the rest of you to, uh, to this conversation. And we're going to be facilitated in our conversation by uh, uh, our friend, Frank Pastore, Talbot graduate, who'll be a moderator today. I can think of no better, better Frank, um, than you to be able to guide this conversation. For those of you who live in Southern California and spend any amount of time in a car, which is obviously a lot of time, right? Um, Frank Pastore is a name that we're all very familiar with uh, as the afternoon drive time host of the Frank Pastore Show, uh, KKLA 99.5. We can uh, daily hear Frank's lively and informative discussions and commentary on current events and cultural situations. Just a little bit of a background on Frank. Before he became a well-known radio personality, Frank was also a familiar name in the, in the world of Major League Baseball. Frank, as some of you might know, pitched for the Cincinnati Reds. <laughs> 1979 to 1985, I'm from Boston. And it was the 1975 World Series against the Cincinnati Reds. That's a deep wound <laughs> for those of us from the hub. But uh, uh, ended his career, uh, Minnesota Twins in 1986. And Frank, just great conversations you and I have had about baseball. Um, even you helping show my newly arrived son in California how to throw a slider, whatever it was. Um, but um, Frank Pastore is not just your run of the mill, major league athlete turned radio personality. He is also a major league thinker. And um, bright mind, uh, degrees in both theology and political science, theology from here at Talbot, political science from the Claremont School, graduated in 1994 from Talbot, summa cum laude, no surprise, um, with a master's degree in philosophy, religion, and ethics. 2003, completed his second master's degree, completing his graduate work in political philosophy and American government just up the road at Claremont. So as an ex-atheist, ex-baseball player, an erudite scholar of theology and politics, Frank brings an eclectic background to the table during his radio program, stimulating me and you and the thousands and thousands of other listeners to combine faith and reason in the thoughtful processing of contemporary issues. Early this year, Frank Pastore's show once again was honored by the National Religious Broadcasters with the prestigious Long Form Radio Program of the Year Award. And NRB President and CEO Dr. Frank Wright said this in praise of the show. Frank Pastore connects with his audience in an exceptional way given his unique background, but more than just providing compelling radio, Frank speaks from an intentionally Christian worldview that provokes his listeners to confront the awesomeness of God and apply their faith to the world around them. Frank is doing an important work and we're honored that he has carved time out of his incredibly busy schedule to be with us today as we talk about what does it mean to be on the front lines of, of, of Christian thinking and culture and society. He's one of California's most public voices on Christian apologetics and he's making the Talbot School of Theology and Bible University extremely proud to boast him as among our alumni. So thank you, Frank, for your robust contribution to public discourse from a Christian perspective. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being our friend. Thank you for being my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming our moderator for today, Frank Pastore. Right on, thank you. <clears throat> okay, but I... I'm not gonna start cheering for the Red Sox, I'm sorry, that's just, that's going too far. All right, so what in the world is going on that you guys would get up at 8.30 in the morning, fight traffic to be here at nine o'clock in the morning to talk about ethics? What is wrong with you people in Los Angeles? <laughs> well, see, that is exactly the point because as Christians, as I'm gonna make the assumption that most of you are, the huge challenge is to realize we are no longer in Jerusalem, and we haven't been for quite a while. We are now in Athens. And the game plan has changed in Athens. Our strategy out of Acts 17 now, much like Paul, is we've got to get a hearing for a belief in God so that we can ultimately get to the gospel. 
and we live in a radically secular, even a hostile post-Christian culture, and you are now at one of the bastions, one of the war colleges that is planning for a major intellectual assault on this culture. And it's being done right here at Talbot School of Theology in Bible University. This is merely one of the early planning sessions for our next blitzkrieg on this culture. And the tool that we're going to be using is the Do the Right Thing product put out by Chuck Colson's wonderful Colson Center. Uh, let's walk through something. Grab your uh, pamphlets that were given to you on the way in so that you know what's in there and I can check off my to-do box, okay? One of those is, of course, the, the large um, light green, pastel green. This is the winter catalog of upcoming events much like this, that the apologetics program that is truly the world-class program is being done here. I'm proud to be part of the second semester when this thing started. And the vision for the leaders was, wouldn't it be wonderful if one day we could have 100 PhDs in philosophy, get tenure at state schools and state universities and attain to positions of influence. Wow, what a wonderful impact that would make. We passed that threshold several years ago, and I'm sure Scott Ray will share some of that. So this is really where it's happening. You've been invited into sort of the planning session of the, at the War College, and it's so neat that you guys are here at nine o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. So that's the first schedule thing. The second one is the uh, card here for ordering the DVD series. Now here's how this is supposed to work. The planning is, much like the Truth Project from Focus on the Family and Del Tackett and the gang, what they want to do is let's get this, this DVD curriculum into the hands of people who can then function as facilitators to not only know this material themselves, but to be replicators and to invite friends and family in the neighborhood or in the condo project or the apartment complex or in your homeschool group or your small group at church to do this curriculum because it is radically contagious. Once you get it and you're infected with how to have an impact in culture, uh, you cannot restrain that virus and it goes forward. As has been famously said, there is a very good reason why we name our pets Caesar and Nero and Pharaoh and our children Peter and Paul. And it's because we won. And, and how did we win? We outlived. <laughs> We outlived and outloved the world. We lived in such a way that the world wants what we got. In Christian theological, biblical terms, we manifested the gospel. We lived it out in flesh so that the world would say, I want a marriage like that. I want a family like that. I want to run my business like that. I want to have that kind of reputation. And they're pointing at the Christians. Double witness an opportunity to, uh, to be heard. If we live in such a way that the world wants what we got, they're gonna ask questions. To begin to answer questions when people aren't asking them is radically obnoxious. But once you've won the right to be heard and the people want, why are you like that? Why do you run your business like Chick-fil-A? Why do you run your business with integrity? Come on, everyone else is taking advantage of customers. Charge them an extra 20%. Everyone rips off stuff from the mailroom. Why aren't you? And you've lived in such a way that the world wants what you got. It's all about ethics, doing the right thing. And I'm thrilled to be here with my friends, uh, Sean McDowell and John Stone Street and Scott and Chuck to talk about this. And so I want you to get the DVD series and I want you to become replicators of this material to not only digest it yourself, but to become well, just overwhelmed with it so that it is spilling out of you and you begin living in such a way that it has an influence on others. And when they ask you, you will have great confidence, confide, with faith in what to say. And that's the whole idea. As you know, apologetics is not, I'm sorry, I'm really, really sorry. It's answering, <laughs> it's, it's answering the questions that people ask. And we have a culture that is literally going to hell and they've lost their way completely. And what a golden opportunity for the, the church to outlive the world here in Los Angeles and elsewhere. Whether it's what's going on right now in Egypt or the financial scandals recently that we saw on the DVD or just open the newspaper as I do every day on my show, you can see the influence or the lack thereof of a Christian worldview on the relevant events of the day. That's our task. Who's going to lead? Who's gonna do it? We need to be like Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me. 
And so only you can reach your sphere of influence. Now you can get equipped by these wonderful uh, men and women who have spent much of their lives studying and putting it in such a way that it is easily accessible. And the Do the Right Thing DVD series is all part of that. Uh, Barry gave me a far too grandiose introduction. Uh, I am like a hard-throwing right-hander in the minor league. I'm a dime a dozen. I know that I'm easily replaceable tomorrow by Salem Communications. I'm just thrilled to have a job in this economy. Uh, and I'm still trying to do the right kind of thing every single day. There is a video that we're gonna watch here uh, in a moment. And uh, we're gonna bring up Chuck Colson. How many of you have read a book by Chuck Colson? Raise your hand. Okay, let's close in prayer. Um, so. <laughs> I love having Chuck on, and one of the things we were joking earlier in the back room with, uh, with Chuck and I, and one of the ways I love to tease Dr. Dobson is to say, you know, all the market research we do at KKLA, uh, he still persistently is number two behind Chuck Colson. And so uh, I'm thrilled to have Chuck as, as not only a friend, but also as a mentor. I too have read Chuck's stuff. Huge influence on me. As, as you have, and today we have the privilege of being with him live. Some of the things you may not know about Chuck, by the way, he was awarded the $1 million Timbleton Prize back in 1993 for progress in religion. And what you may not know about that is he donated all $1 million back to his ministry, as he does with his honorariums, his book royalties, and his speaking fees. He's the real thing. And so he's not getting rich off of speaking engagements at Biola. Uh, what he's doing is he's putting it right back into the ministry because that's where his treasure is. And you can, you can see that value that he places on that. President Bush awarded him the highest civilian award, the second highest civilian award that the US government can grant upon one of its citizens, the Presidential um, Citizen Medal for his humanitarian work with prison fellowship. Uh, he is a graduate of Brown University, went to George Washington Law School. He was a captain, hurrah, in the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> and of course, he spent uh, a little bit of time at the White House. So let's watch a video. And this is from the DVD series that uh, I'm, we're encouraging you to get. The form, by the way, you can fill it out here. There's a table outside that you can submit or you can do it online as well. And uh, I'm just so glad that you're all here. So I've said my piece. And let's hear from these wonderfully engaging speakers who will be helping us to understand and discern how to do the right thing. We'll have a uh, panel discussion at the living room here a little bit later. And uh, if you do not have your question answered that you'd like asked, uh, I'm sure there's a way in which you can get that to us. Uh, call in to the Frank Pastore Show at the intersection of faith and reason. We will engage it. Let's watch this video and then let's begin. Thank you for being here.